ये आखी ये सेन हाँ है हेलो I just uh, published the grades for the discussion, but I don't know if you saw my comments. I just opened it, but your analysis or your response uh, was really great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, th thank you. But uh, my explanation is not enough, so. Uh, well, I mean, we start slow, Aki, you know, it's all good. Thank you. No, I think it was great. I mean, you know, I, I, the thing about this type of class is I really am just sort of trying to show you some of the basic mm -hmm. of literary analysis, right? Because it is that type of class. We, you know, it's not like a full on literature, you know, it's not an English literature class, but again, I'm, I'm really happy with just what, you know, the skills that you were practicing there. Great. Yeah. Really, really great. Thank you so much. Of course. And then then Sanan. Hi, Professor, how are you? Okay, how are you doing? Good, Hi, thank professor. you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Week six, you know, we're still there, getting close to the middle of the semester, one day at a time. How are you guys doing? Good, thank you. How about yourself? Just making sure. Yeah, I'm the same. You know me, doing my thing. Are you taking other classes, Linda? Yes. What other classes? It's speech 362. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's kind of difficult, but it's still like, you know, communication and doing some videos and some writing. Is I like writing, but doing like a videos, like it's interview it's or <laughs> self video. I just like, a, you know, especially if you like a doing for yourself, you feel like, a, oh, I'm just by myself. Right. Confusing me. Or is it, um, are there Zoom classes or is it all yes. synchronous? Yes, oh, no, that's... Zoom with camera too. Like a, you should like open your camera and it just, it, because it's communication like a class. Makes sense. So we should like to see each other and yeah. uh, the professor put us in a group to do some interviews sometimes or some, cool. some like a discussion. Mm -hmm. That's good, that's good, that's great. Yeah, we'll wait another minute or two, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how small the class is today. I thought, will it just be me sort of lecturing into the empty space? But uh, but there is important stuff that I want to talk about today. So if you're watching the recording, hey, keep watching because this is going to be important information. And for Aki, for Sanad and Linda, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we have anybody here today. That's great. I'm going to introduce the poetry project. So, you know, 200 points, grades, you know, then people start to get, you know, then it's like, wait, what? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I've seen that already. <laughs> okay, good. good. Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce it today. Uh, and, and it's really just, a, we're going to just keep practicing, right? We'll practice again this week and even we'll have one more class before it's due. So, um, yeah, we'll be good. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's easy. It's not that much hard. I think you'll enjoy it. Again, I'm I, like mm -hmm. I, I was saying to Aki, her response in the discussion was great. I put one more lesson in Canvas for you to practice analyzing. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of say this again for the people who are watching on the recording. But um, I put a project or another lesson in Canvas with a due date. But I'll just tell you guys now, Aki and Sanat and Linda, uh, that's that the due date is just if you submit it before then, I'll look at it and give you feedback. So if you want more feedback about how to do analysis, that way I can look at it and, and sort of say, yes, you're doing this great. Or hey, you know, for the for the big paper, for the big project, do something different. So so you'll get plenty more practice before the before the papers do. Uh -huh. How about you guys? Any questions? Sanada, Aki, or Linda, since it's just the three of you in our private workshop today? <laughs> <laughs> this is like, you know, a private school education, you guys. You're, we're getting like a seminar in, in a private school. They call this a seminar, just like five or six students with the professor, you know. Um, any, I like it. Any, do you do or you don't? I like it, yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I like it too. 
my dream kind of is, um, I, I, well, my dream, my goal, my goal is to sort of try and teach these community college classes in that same way. You know, I think that this style of learning where you really get to work with the students one-on-one -on -one and, and you, all, you all already know the way I like to work is like ask you guys questions, sort of hope inspire you to think in a new and different way. That's kind of how I like to teach, so. Even in a big group, I try, but it's much easier with three students instead of 30 students, I will tell you that. Yeah, but if this class were in-person class, I think it would more good, more be better. Yeah. yeah, even better. Yeah. I think yeah. classes, right? I think all that, well, maybe there are some classes that are great for online, but yeah, anything, yeah. anything where you're talking about like what it means to be a human being, it's good to have other human beings with you instead of just, you know, I'm happy to see you guys, but I know I'm just sitting in a room talking by myself. You know what I mean? You guys aren't really here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's get started. I'm grateful for you guys for being here. And again, uh, for my folks watching the recording, hi, I hope you're watching. And you should be grateful to Aki and Sanat and Linda because they will help us be our guides through this lesson for today. But yeah, it is Monday, September 27th. We are here in week six of the fall 2021 semester. Here's what we're doing today. Uh, like Linda was saying, maybe she already looked at the poetry project, but I'm going to show you the poetry project, make sure that it's clear, answer any questions about the instructions, what to do, and all that stuff. Then I'm going to talk about poetic rhythm, uh, and I want to be careful here. This We could do a whole class on poetic rhythm, or a whole, um, like a semester on poetic rhythm. So again, I'm just going to introduce it. This is going to be the last new part of poetic analysis that I'm going to show you guys this semester. And like I said, we're just going to dip our toe in, to use a metaphor there, right? We're just going to get a, a quick idea uh, because uh, for the poetry project, you might decide that you want to practice this a little bit. You know, I think it can be fun and interesting to do. And then after I introduce the poetry project, after I talk a little bit about poetic rhythm, then we're just gonna keep practicing, right? So last week we got to practice responding to poetry using those three questions in Professor Noor's textbook. Here, we're gonna talk about analyzing the poetic structure. And again, of course, these two things go together, but you know, the poetic structure is, is when I ask you to look at a little bit um, more specific details in the poem, right? Okay, so the poetry project, like I say on this slide here, it is in Canvas. So I'm gonna go into Canvas and I'm gonna turn on student view. So it looks the way that it looks for all of you. For this one, I go to assignments. Of course, I put it in modules as well, but you can go to assignments, excuse me. And because I gave this one a due date, it is up here in the upcoming assignments tab. So I'm just gonna click it. And here are all the instructions, all the information, everything is here in Canvas for you. But as usual, I also have it in a Word document format. And you guys know I like the Word document better. So I'm going to click here and download it. And let's just walk through the project. So here are the instructions. So. For this writing assignment, I'm asking you to write about poetry. I'm also going to give you the opportunity to write poetry in English if you would like to do so. I know Susanna last week was like, we have to? No, you have the choice. So you've got two options for this poetry project. And like Linda said, my goal is that it's not too hard and hopefully even a little bit fun. So here's option A. If you want to try writing poems in English, Here's what I want you to do in option A. So you will write two original poems in English. Each poem must be at least 15 lines long. So I don't care how many stanzas you could have, you know, like we saw last week, you could have a stanza with one line. So you could have 15 one line stanzas, that's fine. One stanza of 15 lines, that's fine too. But I want at least 15 lines. Then, 
after you write your two poems, I want you to write 600 words analyzing each poem. So poem number one, you write 600 words to analyze your own poem. And then poem number two, you write 600 words to analyze that second poem. So a total of 1,200 words uh, of analysis. I wanna be clear here, right? Analysis, analysis, analysis. Now, you should analyze your own poems for any of the poetic elements we've analyzed, including alliteration, consonants, assonance, lines, azira, enjambment, stanza, simile, metaphor. We could also add rhythm and meter to this list, which we're going to talk about today, okay? So when I say analyze, that's what I mean. You write the poem and then write about the sounds, the rhymes, the lines of your own poetry. That's 1,200 words. Option B. You're gonna choose one of the poems in the ESLW 350 poetry document. I know we looked at this last week, but again, that's right here in Canvas. If you click it, uh, excuse me, sorry. It, I, I need to fix that link, it should be better. Oh my goodness, I need to fix this, you guys. I'm so sorry about that. Let me do this. Yeah, it happens that to me too. Like I open pages and pages and it just like it was this. But, but then you can find it on pages. I know, but let me fix it better. It's much better. Um, I know this is really boring to watch me do, but it's important. So give me just maybe a minute here and I'll have this fixed. Yeah, I know I, I, I shared it in the link from, um, this is it, from the live uh, support materials. And I know I put it in the pages, just like you said, Linda. Let yeah. Me this in the assignment sheet though. That's really, that's really important. Good thing I didn't assign it last week, poetry project. Yeah, last semester I had some different poems. That's so if you saw it, Linda, that's what you were looking at. So let's remove this link and put in the correct link. Thank you all for your patience. Aha. So again, in the assignment sheet where it says choose one of the poems, and this is option B again, choose one of the poems in the ESLW 350 poetry document to analyze. That's this, click this link and it'll take you right here. Again, this is where we looked at some of these poems last week, right? So you'll choose just one of these poems. So choose just one of these poems. And then for that poem, excuse me, first, you will write a 500 word response to the poem. You should use the three response questions that we discussed and practiced in class. And mm -hmm. if you completed the discussion activity for uh, Fire and Ice, I just published those grades today. So um, they're there. You can see examples and feedback from me saying, this was good, change this, or do this, do something different. So 500 words of response to answer those three questions. Then you'll write a 1,000 word analysis of the poem. You should analyze poetic elements that we've studied this semester, including stanzas, lines, alliteration, consonants, assonances, your and jamming, simile, metaphor, and meter, right? So when I say analysis, again, I think it's pretty clear and we all understand, but analysis means the structure, response means the three questions that we practiced from Professor Noor's textbook. So I wanna show you the grading, but does questions about these two options? Yes, yes Linda, please. Uh, like, uh, I'm gonna go with the, like I says, option B, okay. because it's easy. I cannot like I write on my own pod, unless if I Google it or find something interesting. Okay. But this one, I'm gonna go with the option B. But like my question, should like a first week, uh, like a first, the first writing about 500 word, uh -huh. should we like a first, like, like a copy and paste the same poem and then we just uh, like a response for that or reflection for on that? Or like, we just like to say the poem, the, the, uh, the topic and by let's say the author, the name of the author, and then we gonna continue writing. Yeah, that's a good question. Students had this question last semester too. I'm going to keep this one really easy. Um, I haven't taught you guys the structure of a literary analysis paper yet. I'm going to do that when we start to read the, the two shorter books. So for this one, Linda, you could sort of, especially that first 500 response, 
uh, 500 word response, you can just treat that like a discussion activity. Now, if you choose to, uh, to analyze fire and ice, you will need to write some more words. You, you, you know, you could copy and paste, but then I don't think uh, that, that, that that will be a 500 word minimum yet. But if you uh -huh. want to do that same style, that same structure, uh, that is totally fine with me. You know, and in this type of essay, I'll say to everybody, if you even wanted to say I, me, in my opinion, that's totally fine. Uh, like I said, I will teach you the sort of structure for a, a true literary analysis paper when we move to the full books. Okay, and it's gonna be like a two, like a, let's say two separated like a writing assignment or together all of it, we're gonna submit it. Yeah, it's all it's all going to be together in the same document. So I've got an example here, I think, too. Of a, uh, so first of all, uh, I've got a poetry help project video. This kind of helps answer Linda's question. So I've got a video of myself sort of doing this in live time, right? I use an example poem and I sort of talk out loud and walk you through this process. Um, mm -hmm for an example. And, and if you watch this video, which I hope you will, you'll sort of see yeah. how my example paper looks, right? Uh, but I also wanted to show you, let's see, if I download the example, that's this poetry project example. Okay, I got lots of computer problems to fix. <laughs> let me fix this in files real quick. It'll look like this. And let me let me download it here. Great thing. Good thing you asked, Linda. Thank you. Why is this blocked, though? That doesn't really make sense. Because it was unpublished for whatever reason. Publish. Okay. Goodness. Let me make sure this works now. Student view. Assignments. Poetry project. And poetry project example. And as I say here, right, this is an incomplete. I, I'm not giving you a full, you know, template to just copy, uh -huh. but it'll still be helpful for you, I think. And it looks like this, right? I sort of broke it up in this way. So, you know, just like your usual format. Mm -hmm. And then you could just label, right? The first you could say, here's my response and then I'm going to respond. Yeah. And then you could just do another little header here for analysis. And even if you wanted to break it up, you know, here I'm gonna write, you know, two or 300 words about sounds and lines. And then here I'm gonna start to write about simile and metaphor. Now, again, my only warning, if you're watching the recording or just to tell you specifically, Linda, I, I will want sort of paragraphs. You can't, don't just make lists like I have here because that, that this is, you'll see if you watch the helper video, what I'm doing here. So just give me nice clean paragraphs. You can break it up into two different sections. You can yeah. use letters to make it clear, however you want to do it, Linda. Like you teach us last, uh, like uh, in my previous class with you, 310, like a grammar 310, you teach us like I do this. Even if you want to like do the response, we just like label respond and then we just write the paragraph or the essay that we want. Like a, exactly. you teach us like that. Yeah, exactly. And as you keep going, you know, if you've already taken English 300 or if you're going to keep studying, you'll see this this headers, you know, put, you know, one little line with the like sort of giving a title to the section. This is really common, a really normal way to sort of break up longer essays. So this is what we'll do for the poetry project. And like I said, um, before we finish the semester, when we start to do the, the longer analysis of the books, I'll sort of give you a little basic information about the structure of a true, you know, if you, if you, have a if you want a degree in English literature like I have, you know, what does an English literature essay kind of look like? I'll show you, but even that's different than a poetic essay. So I didn't want to teach both. It's a little too much. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Professor. Of course. Any other questions about uh, option A, option B, um, before I show the, the grades and stuff like that, uh, the grading and the rubric and stuff like that? Cool. Well, like Linda, Linda, Aki, you had a, a question? Yeah, no, so far, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, well, like Linda said, if you're like Linda and you think, oh my goodness, I cannot write a poem, I know I'm gonna do option B, that's great. 
And if you're like, ooh, I want to try to write a poem, I, I hope you will, right? I'm not going to grade your poem for, uh, is it a, an amazing poem? I, I don't care. I, I want to give you the chance to try it and then sort of think about your own writing, right? So that's, I, I hope that if you are even a little bit curious to try writing your own poem in English, I hope you will try it. So I hope you will try it. All right, so like I say here first, this is one of the very few assignments with a due date. It is due October 11th, that is two weeks from today. And remember, it has a due date because you will submit it on the 11th. And then I will grade it and give you corrections and feedback one week later. And then you will have time to revise and resubmit for a higher grade if you want, right? I have to give it a due date because I have to know when I can grade all of them together. So first draft is due October 11th. Then I will grade it and give it back to you one week later on the 18th. And then as I say here, you have one week from the date of the initial grade or my feedback to resubmit your essay for a higher grade. So if we look at the calendar here, your essay will be due on the 11th. I will grade it by the 18th. And then if you want to revise for a higher score, you could do that by the 25th. I know that feels like it's a long way away, but I'll, and I'll talk more about it, but that's the, that's the due dates. So any question about these due dates or that process? If you've taken a class, you know, Linda knows, you know, the, the revise and resubmit for a higher grade. You, you, Linda knows how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions about the due dates? Cool. So let me tell you what I am grading you on. So it is out of 200 points, right? This is a, a fairly significant, I think this is 20% of your grade for the whole semester. So the poetic analysis is worth 120 points. And that means you're writing effectively analyze the poems using some of the poetic terms we studied this semester, including alliteration, consonants, assonance, lines, azura, and jamming, stanza, simile, metaphor. Originality and effort. Your writing shows originality, careful thought, and obvious effort. Does it look like you wrote it in five hours or 30 minutes? Teachers always know. Then 20 points for editing. Your writing is free of major grammatical and mechanical errors, including capitalization, punctuation, spelling, sentence structure, verb forms. If you make big grammar mistakes, I will help point them out to you or show them to you when I grade it. And you can always go back and fix that grammar stuff. This is not a grammar class. I'm not gonna punish you, uh, but I will sort of show you if you're making some grammar errors, how you can fix them. And then length, right? You get 10 points just for meeting the minimum word requirement. But like you all know, if you've taken a class with me, if you submit an essay to me that is 1,480 words long, I will take the 10 points. So just give me 1,200 words or 1,500 words. Uh, and that is the rubric for the grading. Last call, any questions at all? So that's the, this is it. This is the poetry project. And I hope you agree with Linda. It's, it's not supposed to be super big and super scary. I hope it's a little bit fun, uh, but it should be challenging because I am going to ask you to do some new skills, you know, so that's my goal. But any questions about anything that I just talked about? All right, sweet. So that is two weeks from today. I look forward to reading your first draft in two weeks. Now, as I say here, I also wanted to show you what is coming up and, and make sure again, you get plenty of time to practice that writing project, right? So lesson nine, if you haven't done it, please do it. I think five or six people have, maybe six or seven, I forget. Uh, but if you haven't, Go ahead and do it. It's gonna give you more practice doing the discussion to the three questions, right? Which you're gonna do in the essay. And then I've, I've posted lesson 10. I'll show you that right now. And then the poetry project is due on 10, 11 in two weeks. So one week from today is some more, uh, another opportunity for you to practice analyzing poetic structure and to get a grade and feedback from me. So let me show you what that is in Canvas. Again, if we go to the assignments, 
here in lesson 10. Again, it's up here in upcoming assignments because I put a due date on it. So if you click that assignment, here's what it looks like. So here I've got a poem. It's a poem by Emily Dickinson. I will probably get to share some information with you and teach you about Emily Dickinson later today. Uh, but here's the poem. And then I have an audio recording of me reading the poem out loud so that you can hear the sound, you can hear some of the rhythm, you can hear some of those different things. So this is the poem that I want you to analyze. And here are the instructions. One, it says, read and listen to the poem several times. Two, once you feel like you have found some kind of personal meaning in the poem, I want you to write a 400 word minimum analysis of the poem. And you must analyze the poem for at least two of the following poetic structures. Again, these should look very familiar by now. Alliteration, consonants, assonance, lines, stanzas, azira, enchantment, symbol, metaphor, simile, or rhythm. Again, rhythm is what we are talking about today. So if you're thinking, oh my goodness, what's that? You will know in a few minutes. So this one I want you to do in a Word document, or if you click start, uh, I think I gave you, you could do it in a text entry too. So I, I let people do it in the text if you want. You can upload a Microsoft Word file. You can uh, type a document in your Google Docs, whatever you want to do. But again, this is just practice analyzing the poem instead of responding to the poem. So let me be super clear here. The three questions, not for this project, right? That is responding. This is doing a sort of more specific analysis of line structure, consonants, assonance, and some of the things that we've practiced doing in class together. And the last thing I say, and then I'll take questions is, so I put the due date again by next Sunday. And that's because if you can give me something, send me something by next Sunday, I will grade it probably that Monday. I'll try and grade it as soon as possible and give you feedback and say, hey, you know, uh, your analysis of consonants and assonance was great, uh, but you know, uh, you need to fix some of the stuff that you talked about with the symbol, right? I, I just wanna be able to give you some more feedback about poetic analysis before you do the big project, before you do, do the big poetry project. Um, so again, if you, and if, uh, if you're late, right? If you don't have it in by Sunday, that's fine. I won't take points off, but you just might not get my feedback and help. I think that's the last thing I wanted to I say. I have a question on okay. this. I'm sorry if I ask a lot, but sometimes like a, oh, I want to just and to understand your questions so I can respond. So Please. like a, Yoka, the first one you said read and the second one, once you feel like you have found some kind of personal meaning in the poem, what, what do you mean about this? I mean, once you understand what the poem, I mean, it's hard to write an analysis of the poem if you feel like you don't even know what the poem is about, right? Like, and this is why we start with responding. Most students like to respond more. It's more of the no right, no wrong answer type of thing. But, but what happens when students just go to the analysis, right? When they don't think about the meaning, uh, you, you kind of lose, I think I, I'm, I'm talking too much. I want you to make sure you understand what the poem means yeah. Before you give me your analysis. So, so that, like I give you the main point you mean about no, the poem? No, you don't need to write your main point. You just need to, let me say this. If you analyze the sounds in the poem, or if you analyze a specific symbol in the poem, right? For example, uh -huh. I'll just tell you right now, um, feathers, perches, sings, bird there's some bird stuff going on yes. in this poem uh -huh. there's uh -huh. there's a bird, there's a symbol of a bird now you could very easily write about oh there's a symbol of a bird in the poem but in order to explain what that means or why it matters you have to make sure that you understand what the poem is and this is a little bit different than you know the three questions why does the poem end the way that it ends that is a different question than what is the main symbol and what's the meaning of that symbol, right? So I don't want you to just say this poem made me feel X, Y, and Z, but I do wanna make sure that before you just tell me, oh, there's lots of um, whatever, there's lots of S sounds in the poem. I wanna make sure you understand the poem. I wanna make sure you understand the poem so that when you give me your analysis, you're connecting the meaning of the poem and the structure of the poem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now that's my long answer. That's my long answer, Linda.
And and if you're thinking, if you're if Linda's thinking, or if any of you guys are thinking, or if you're watching the recording thinking, I don't know how to do that. That's because we haven't practiced it. You know, you haven't practiced it yet. I've sort of given you some examples, and we'll do more today. But this will be the first time you're doing it, and that's why I want you to do it at least once before you do it for the big poetry project. Yeah. Other questions. Excuse me. Cool. All right. Well, I hope that you can uh, practice before Sunday. I'm really excited to see sort of what you want to talk about and analyze for the poem, for this poem. And again, we will, um, this is what we're doing today. We're going to really do a sort of structural analysis of the poem, of poems today. Cool. So last call, questions about lesson nine, lesson 10, or the poetry project before I get started today. Cool. Let's talk about rhythm. Let's talk about rhythm in poetry. Now, uh, I've got a Word document here instead of a full, I've got some other PowerPoint slides that I'll show us today, but, but I've got a Word document that I want to start with today. So um, I want to open up our 350 Word doc too here, excuse me. Great. All right, so uh, there's three main ways that poets create rhythm. And even the word rhythm is hard to explain, right? The way that we talk and think about rhythm, usually, what do we think about? It's a beat of a poem. I, I love, Linda said beat. And, and usually I would just say, often when we talk about the word rhythm, we're talking about music, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about music. And in fact, I don't always show it, but we've got a small enough class. I think it would be really cool to show it. Um, there's a really great uh, YouTube video here that I love because even though it's not explicitly about, um, oh, it's so good, this video, you guys. Let me share my sound. Now, this, this video is not about rhythm in poetry. It's about rhythm in music. But I still think that, what, first of all, you're going to learn just from watching it. And I still think that understanding what, they, what, what we mean when we talk about rhythm and how it's a part of such a deep part of music, it will really help you understand um, some of what we're talking about today. So I'll start this, we'll play it. It's only five minutes, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. And then I'll show you sort of how rhythm, which in music is pretty easy, right? We can go. Rhythm in music is kind of obvious, right? Because we have these sounds and beats. When in poetry, we only have the language and, the, and it's a little more difficult. So, so let's watch the video, talk about it. And then, and then I'll talk about how it connects to, uh, to just language instead of in music. So here's the video. Uh, do I have captions on? Yes, I do. We usually think of rhythm as an element of music, but it's actually found everywhere in the world around us. From the ocean tides to our own heartbeats, rhythm is essentially an event repeating regularly over time. Even the ticking of a clock itself is a sort of rhythm. But for musical rhythm, a steady string of repeating single beats is not enough. For that, we need at least one opposing beat with a different sound, which can be the unstressed offbeat or the accented backbeat. There are several ways to make these beats distinct, whether by using high and low drums or long and short beats. Which ends up being heard as the main beat is not a precise rule, but like the famous Rubens vase, can be reversed depending on cultural perception. In standard notation, rhythm is indicated on a musical bar line. But there are other ways. Remember that ticking clock? Just as its round face can trace the linear passage of time, the flow of rhythm can be traced in a circle. The continuity of a wheel can be a more intuitive way to visualize rhythm than a linear score that requires moving back and forth along the page. We can mark the beats at different positions around a circle, using blue dots for main beats, orange ones for off beats, and white dots for secondary beats. Here is a basic two-beat rhythm with a main beat and an opposing off beat. 
or a three-beat rhythm with a main beat, an off beat, and a secondary beat. And the spaces between each beat can be divided into further. I wanted to pause for a second. Okay, so you guys kind of with me so far. This is not a music class, but at least you see you see sort of what we're talking about here. I want to just emphasize we're going to see some examples of different musical rhythms. But the idea here is that rhythm, and, and he speaks pretty quickly here, right? But that rhythm is a pattern, right? Rhythm is a pattern that repeats over and over again. This is one reason that music is so pleasant to the human ear, right? And he's going to talk about this when you hear doom, da, doom, da, doom, da, doom, da. Or when they talked about three beats, right? Doom, da, doom, doom, da, doom. I mean, this is kind of what he's talking about in the video. Does this make basic sense, you guys? Linda? Yes. Okay, you with me? Linda's? I said yes. No. Okay, no, I, yes. I, I heard you. Okay, good. Uh, and again, you know, I, no one has to talk. It's just, I want to make sure that no one's like, oh my God, what is happening? But that's the basic idea. Now, just like that's the rhythm is a pattern, right? Rhythm is a pattern that repeats. We could have a sort of infinite, endless variety of different patterns. And that's what we're going to see in the video. Now, today, I'm not going to teach you an infinite, endless variety of poetic rhythm but different poems have different types of rhythm, just like different music has different rhythm, right? So that's, that's again why I'll, I'll continue with the video. I'll, I'll be quiet and let it finish now. Let's look at some examples. There are sub beats using multiples of either two or three. Layering multiple patterns using concentric wheels lets us create more complex rhythms. For example, we can combine a basic two-beat rhythm with off-beats to get a four-beat system. This is the recognizable backbone of many genres popular around the world, from rock, country, and jazz, to reggae, and cumbia. Or we can combine a two-beat rhythm with a three-beat one. Eliminating the extra main beat and rotating the inner wheel leaves us with a rhythm whose underlying feel is 3-4. This is the basis of the music of whirling dervishes, as well as a broad range of Latin American rhythms, such as joropo. And even Bach's famous chacon. Now, if we remember Rubens' vase and hear the off beats as the main beats, this will give us a 6 8 feel, as found in genres such as chacarera and cueca, Persian music, and more. In an 8 beat system, we have three layered circles, each rhythm played by a different instrument. We can then add an outermost layer consisting of an additive rhythmic component, reinforcing the main beat and increasing accuracy. Now let's remove everything except for this combined rhythm and the basic two beat on top. This rhythmic configuration is found as the Cuban cinquillo in the Puerto Rican bomba, and in Northern Romanian music. And rotating the outer circle 90 degrees counterclockwise gives us a pattern often found in Middle Eastern music. As well as Brazilian choro. Argentinian tango.
In all of these examples, the underlying rhythm reinforces the basic one-two, but in different ways depending on arrangement and cultural context. So it turns out that the wheel method is more than just a nifty way of visualizing complex rhythms. By freeing us from the tyranny of the bar line, we can visualize rhythm in terms of time, and a simple turn of the wheel can take us on a musical journey around the world. Cool. So again, I know there's a lot of sort of, it can get complicated, right? But I, I just, I love this video. I love music, generally speaking. So um, I think it's a really cool way to think about rhythm in music. But again, what the other reason I love showing this video when I have time is you really see how rhythm and where we understand the rhythm where, and uh, today you're going to hear me talk about stress, right? Because we, we think about stress with syllables in pronunciation all the time, but of course, because words have a certain stress on where we give the emphasis to the syllable, that stress is almost like they were saying, okay, a long drum sound and a short drum sound or a high drum sound and a low drum sound, right? So that this is sort of my, my connection to rhythm and stress and syllables and how a little bit of changing in, in where you put the stress in the music and all of a sudden you can go from rock and roll music to, you know, like they were saying, Middle Eastern sort of whirling dervish Persian music. Um, any, any ideas or any thoughts about this video? Too, was it too much or is it interesting for you guys? I hope it was somewhat useful if we have any music fans in the class. I'll put the link in our um, in our life support materials page so you can access it later if you want. But this is why um, this is why I only briefly introduced rhythm, right? Because that video was very short and yet if you were thinking, oh my God, like what is going on? This is way too much. Right, rhythm can start to feel very complicated very quickly, and this is just an introduction class, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to scare you away. Uh, this is a TED Talk video, and it's called Visualizing Rhythm. Okay, so I had you watch this video about rhythm. How does this connect to poetry, Jeff? Why, why are you doing this? I will show you. So in rhythm, uh, rhythm in poetry comes from three main areas, two of which we have already talked about, right? One is cesira and enjambment. And we've talked about that the last two weeks, right? Where the poet puts a period, a comma, or a line break, an enjambment, is really sort of, again, think of it like the musical score, right? It is guiding you about where you should stop, pause, break the rhythm, right? So Cezira and Enjambment, we've talked about the most, that is really gonna guide you about the rhythm of the poem. The other one, and we talked about this last week for a few minutes, is rhyme. You know, in poems that have a very strong and clear rhyme scheme, that is really going to determine how you speak the poem. And the example that I gave you last week was this, this first one here where we've got really true and clear and obvious rhymes, right? And again, this is how many, how much. I'll read it one time for you just so you see. Well, I'll do it twice. So the first time I'm going to read it sort of what I'm suggesting, the way that the rhyme scheme forces the reader to say it, right? The rhyme makes the reader read it in the way that I'm about to do it right now. So how many, how much? How many slams in an old screen door? Depends how loud you shut it. How many slices in a bread? Depends how thin you cut it. How much good inside a day? Depends how good you live them. How much love inside a friend? Depends how much you give them. The rhymes at the end of line two, four, six, and eight really sort of, again, force the reader, <laughs> excuse me, force the reader to read that, that in that rhythm, right? To, 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 to the rhythm that I just did. Now, what I'm gonna try to do is try and read it in a different way and see if I can make it, I'm gonna read it differently and you guys tell me if this makes, if it sounds strange to you, just looking at the page, right? 
All right, let's see if I can do this. How many, how much with wrong rhythm? How many slams in an old screen door depends how loud you shut it, how many slices in a bread depends, how thin you cut it, how much good inside a day depends, how good you live them, how much inside a friend depends, how much you give them. It's painful. Sounds weird. Please tell me it sounds weird. <laughs> and I hope it sounds weird. I love today. I just feel like I'm talking to myself. This is fantastic. Um, I hope it sounds weird because I am breaking every rule that the poem is giving me. The poem says, stop at the punctuation. Jeff, stop at the question mark. Stop at the period. Stop at the question mark. Stop at the period. So one thing I did to make the poem sound strange is just blow through the punctuation. Remember, if I'm talking about two, three ways for rhythm, one is a zero and in jamming. So if you don't stop where the poet tells you to stop, you're not using the correct proper rhythm of the poem. Right. The second one is if you see these true rhymes, shut it, cut it, live them, give them, and you're not reading the poem in a way that sort of emphasizes, emphasizes those rhymes, you're also sort of breaking what the poet is asking you to do. Does this make a little bit of sense? Yes, it is. Good. And, uh, you know, hopefully you can go back and listen to my ugly reading of the poem. It feels wrong. It feels wrong. It feels wrong. But it's good to see an example of why, right? Now, these things are kind of obvious, I hope, right? Stop when there's a period. Um, if there's two words that rhyme together, rhyme them. Make sure that the, if you're speaking the poem, you hear the rhyme, right? Make sure you hear the rhyme. Now, the most difficult way, and what I'm gonna briefly introduce today is about meter. And meter really is just poetic word for syllables. And actually maybe instead of a, a dash, I'm gonna say meter is syllables, the number of syllables. Now, I, I like to start with uh, a, a specific type of a poetic structure called haiku. Uh, and haiku, I choose haiku because haiku are short and haiku are poems. Um, that are almost entirely about meter and using meter to create the rhythm of a poem. And that's because uh, haiku poems, and I'm only gonna speak about what I know about haiku translated into English, but I have some basic understanding of, of the, how they're written in Japanese as well. But a, a haiku poem is three lines, one stanza, three lines, and there is a specific meter to those three lines. So the first line has must have five syllables. The second line must have seven syllables. And, and the third line must have five syllables. So if you've ever seen the word haiku, this is what we talk about when we're talking about haiku, right? Five syllables, five, seven, five. So for example, an old silent pond, five, a frog jumps into the pond, seven, splash, silence again. Now, be really clear here, there's also some interesting things happening with caesura because I have a comma here and I have an exclamation point in the middle of the line. This is totally allowed, totally fine. But again, these this poem is a great example of how meter, number of syllables, comes together with caesura, where the author tells you to stop to create a rhythm. Now I'm gonna try and read the poem sort of as the rhythm of the poem is written. So I would say, this is a, a haiku by Matuso Basho. I'm sure I'm saying that totally wrong, but the poem is an old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond, splash, silence again. Now, I'll just point out one thing here with the caesura, right? This exclamation point forces the reader to stop. And notice, when we stop, we have to take a break here when we get this exclamation point. The next word after that caesura is the word silence, which is sort of, again, how meter and meaning come together, right? Because it's sort of fun and interesting. After I say splash, I must make silence, right? I have to stop, I have to create silence. 
And then the next word I say is the word silence again. And this is like Linda's question, right? About, wait a minute, like, what's the difference between responding and analyzing? Or if Jeff says that I need to understand the meaning of the poem, how is that connected to the structure? And here's an example of how structure and meaning come together, right? So there's meter, I stop and take a break. And part of the meaning of the poem is after I take a break, after I stop, after I become silent because of the caesura, I say the word silence again. Um, any questions about this example here? I've talked a little bit about caesura and meter and how they go together. Excuse me, any questions before uh, I go, I continue? So it's kind of like a following the sounds of the speech? Yes, exactly, exactly correct, Linda, because Yes, uh, I want to see if anybody else has a question because I want to I want to give some more specific examples to Linda's question, even with this short little poem. But any mm -hmm. question right now about what I'm saying about meter and syllables here, meter and syllables, because that's what I'm going to look at next in this poem. Okay, so to answer Linda's question, so now I uh, now the only thing I haven't talked about with this very little tiny beautiful little poem. Uh, I've talked about the number of syllables, but like Linda was saying, okay, so this is just kind of about the words and sort of this, the way the words come together. And the answer is yes. And this is really important in a poem like this when we have words with more than one syllable. So for example, an old silent pond. Silent is the only word with two syllables here, right? But in yeah. English, we really can only give the stress or the emphasis to one of these syllables. Which syllable do we stress in silent? Is it silent or silent? Silent, the first one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, where's our next two syllable word? A frog jumps into the pond. Do we have a two syllable word in the second line? No, uh, no. Yeah, we do. We do. There's one two syllable word in line two. What is it? Yeah. Into. Thank okay. you. And where's the stress uh, for into? Is it into or into? Into. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And do we have a two syllable word? A uh, two syllable word in here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it? Silence. 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 Oh, yeah. Silence. Uh, yeah, we've got, yeah, we've got um, splash is one, but then we've got what? Silence again. Excellent. And where's the stressed syllable in silence? Silence or silence? Silence, silence the first one. Thank you. And again, or again, what is it? Again or again? <laughs> again. <laughs> Aki laughed at my stressing <laughs> the first syllable. Right. Absolutely. Okay. People, uh, you know, often in American high schools for, I don't know what this says about American high schools, but um, American high schools love to have students who start to learn about poetry practice haiku because haiku are short and you can sort of start to see the connection between um, meter and rhythm here, right? Because haiku says, five, seven, five, that it has to be five, seven, five. But inside of the five, seven, five, if you've got words with more than one syllable, then again, you are forcing the reader for where the emphasis goes. If you think of the YouTube video that we watched, right? The, the one reason that the YouTube video is confusing and difficult, musical theory can be difficult, is because if you say bum bum in music, you can also say bum bum in music, right? In music, that's fine. But in English, in, in language, you can you you can't you can say again, but you can't say again. That sounds strange. And this is why I was answering Linda's question this way, right? Like Linda's saying, so it's kind of about just how you say the word, and the answer is yes, right? Because the words you choose and where you put that word in the poem is is forcing the, the speaker. To, to give the emphasis to that syllable. And again, that's why it's different than music. In music, bum bum or bum bum, 
that's fine. <laughs> but in spoken language, it, the words are gonna come with a specific syllable stress. And this is what I mean, this combination of the number of syllables and the stressed syllables. This is what we talk about when we talk about meter. Meter just means number of syllables and where the syllables are stressed in the line, right? Not just in the word, but in the line. Questions? Yeah, uh, I, I have no question, but I realized uh, running haiku is, was important it's because I know this haiku. Yeah. I learned in uh, I learned haiku in uh, elementary school. Yes. Yeah. So every Japanese people, Japanese children, learned haiku. Yes. Yeah. So, but now I realize why it's important. Oh, yeah. good. That's really great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, it's my pleasure. And and it's like you know, it's I think it's another thing again. This is such a, it's why I, I can only talk about poetry in English and Spanish because those are my only two language, languages, but I can say, right, poetry is so special and unique because it's all about the rhythm of a language and mm -hmm. every language has its own rhythm, right, Aki? And yeah. that's why different languages and different cultures, they all, like Japan uh, has a, an, an amazing history of poetry, right? But the rhythm of Japanese poetry is very different than American English poetry just because of the, the nature of those languages. Um, I think we've got a few people in our class who speak Russian. Russian has an incredible history of beautiful Russian poetry, right? But again, Russian poetry has a very different rhythm and meter structure because of the nature of that language, right? The way that the stress and the syllables come together usually creates a very specific poetic rhythm, a specific poetic meter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that this is, this one I, I found, there's this one in, uh, is this the poem in Japanese um, actually correctly? Yes, uh, yes, that one. Here? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Cool, amazing, fantastic. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one semester I had another student who, um, now see, here's something I don't know because I don't speak Japanese. I had another student who was from Japan was explaining that when you say this poem in Japanese, that actually some of this, like I was talking about consonants, assonance, and alliteration in English, right? In English, mm -hmm. but some of the sounds in the Japanese actually sound like water, like almost like if you dropped a stone into the water, it's almost mm -hmm. like the sounds of the consonants and the assonance give you that like water sound. Uh, and now I, I don't think she was lying. She was a very good student, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool because you know, things, things that are, you just don't know. You just don't know if you don't speak the language. And again, this is why I don't try and make it too hard for you guys with meter. Meter is really hard for non-native speakers because so much of it is about syllable stress. And even for you guys at 350, I know sometimes syllable stress is, is tricky, it's tricky. <laughs> Um, but I'm really glad that, uh, I'm glad it makes sense to you, Aki, and I'm glad, uh, yeah, I'm glad it makes sense. That's, that's wonderful. Um, any other, any other thoughts about, because now I do want to look at um, how, to, I, I just want to introduce you very briefly. So if we could say haiku is a very um, classic example of how the rhythm of the Japanese language creates specific and beautiful poetry, there is one part of, of, of the English language that has created a very specific English meter, right? And I want to show that to you briefly. But before I do that, anything else about, um, about our haiku here? Because it's my easy example before we look at English. So, so you mean in poetry, uh, place, the places of greater is important, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's just like, I'm sure it's like in Japanese too, um, Aki, right? Um, 
the stress of you know where the syllable comes wherever however you say the word if it's a if it's a syllable with more than one word again a good poet and obviously you know this is a, a master of japanese haiku they they're they are putting the the words together in a way they're aware of the stress in the syllables right and and we're aware of where we're putting these words that have more than one syllable because that's guiding the up and down rhythm of of the speaking yeah yeah Okay. We're going to look at fire and ice. So we're going to we're going to go back to the poem we already looked at yesterday for meter though. Okay, any questions about rhythm? Stress, syllable. Okay. Let's look at the classic American structure. Uh, and I sort of have some brief notes here right Japanese haiku is all about how meter creates the rhythm. Five, seven, uh, excuse me, five, seven, five, three lines. I could say what? Like if we were doing a poetic analysis, right? I could take some notes. One stanza, three lines. The lines are five, seven, five, right? This is kind of just me taking notes on this. Uh, uh, again, this is analysis. Now I'm analyzing the structure, right? I could say, okay, I'm analyzing, you know, a poem by the Japanese haiku master, and I'm describing to you, it's a one stanza poem. There are three lines. The structure is five, seven, five, very clearly. And then we could sort of talk about the rhythm and, and the stress and the unstress. Now in English, there's one classic, <laughs> one classic meter and it's called, now you don't need to worry about this. This is, there's lots of vocabulary here. It's called iambic pentameter. Uh, this is the structure of almost all of Shakespeare's plays and poems. Shakespeare, uh, William Shakespeare, didn't invent this uh, structure, this, this meter, this rhythm, but he sort of became the master of it, right? So if you've ever read any translation or anything of William Shakespeare, you know, when you read it in the native English, which we won't, it's very difficult at this level, um, it's all in iambic pentameter. And let me just explain what that means. Iambic pentameter just means, um, 10 syllable lines stressed of stress of, uh, excuse me, unstressed, stressed syllables. So if I were to explain it in words, you guys, right? And I'm gonna say, for example, you is unstressed, and S is stressed, that means it would be an each, and each letter here is a syllable, you guys. Iambic patema would be unstressed, stressed, two syllables. Unstressed, stressed, two syllables. Unstressed, stressed, two more syllables. Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. So if you count the number of letters here, this should be 10 syllables, right? Unstressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed stress and so on and this is 10 syllables per line now you might be going oh my god what is jeff doing what is he talking about but i'm just going to show you an example of this from a poem you already studied and looked at some say the world will end in fire some say the world will end in fire now we've got some interesting things here right now i've got in English, English poetry is famous for having so many one syllable words. So when we've got a two syllable word anywhere in iambic pentameter, we've got some stuff to do because we've got stress and unstress, right? But when I say iambic pentameter, I say some say the world will end in fire, right? So how many syllables do I have in this line actually? Nine. Nine. Right now, this poem really is in iambic pentameter. It is. It gives you the feeling of ten syllables per line, but.
but because it's breaking this up, it stops short, it gives you this strange uh, innate speaker. It gives a native speaker who's used to this rhythm, a feeling of like, and if we think about the meaning of the poem, it kind of makes sense because we're talking about end, the end of the world. Now let's look at a, a more even uh, clear line here. From what I've tasted of desire. Actually, let me show you a different line here. Hold on one second. I want to show you one that's just more like absolutely uh, perfect, clear iambic pentameter. These images might actually help too. No, too complicated. This is Shakespeare. Again, the language is just too difficult. Again, this is more like children, but let's let's not stress, just as you see something that's really easy. So if you look at this first example, as you can see, it's not that hard to learn. That rhythm, right, of unstressed, stressed. And one of the reasons we know that it's unstressed with these one syllable words is as is usually a preposition or a conjunction. We usually don't stress these words in English, right? But you, see, hard, learn. Hard is an adjective. If you've ever taken a grammar class, Linda, um, you know, these are the content words. We tend to put the content words in the stressed position. And these grammar words, prepositions, uh, it's not that hard. This is sort of a determiner or this is an adverb that modifies the adjective. We tend to put the, um, the grammar words in the unstressed position. But this rhythm, and even if I'm never going to test you on this, guys, but I at least want you to hear it, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll say this again so you hear it, right? As you can see, it's not that hard to learn. You can see it's not that hard to learn this. You can just write like Shakespeare did back then. Did you know that I'm writing like that now? That thing that I'm doing right there, even if it sounds crazy to you guys, that is the, this is like the English language's gift to poetry. Uh, you could hear, you might even hear like very intelligent people tell you, this is the only real meter that exists in the English language. That dun, da, dun, da, dun, dun. Look up and down. Exactly right, exactly right. And, and, and actually you could even say, Linda, it's down and up, right? Because it's unstressed first. So it's da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun. Every Shakespeare sonnet, if you guys ever take a literature class, right? And the reason that I don't show you guys Shakespeare is because again, it's the vocabulary makes it very difficult. Uh, but if you've ever had to study Shakespeare, even in your first language, right? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Now, the other reason I don't show this to you is because, or we don't, I don't make you really study it. I'll show it to you. But Shakespeare's a genius, right? Shakespeare starts to use three syllable words, four syllable words, five syllable words. And the reason that this is so difficult is when you're making those choices with iambic pentameter in a word like um, um, undetermined. How about this word? Undetermined, undetermined. I've got four syllables. Where's the main stress? I'll just say it, undetermined, undetermined. Determined. Yeah, I'd say it's right here, right? It's the third syllable. Undetermined. Men. So this is difficult for a poet who wants to write in iambic pentameter, right, you guys? Because we've got four syllables. The stress is here. And in the rules of this particular meter in the English language, I've got two unstressed syllables here. This doesn't usually work. So if you put it, if you put the word, um, I am undetermined. Uh, maybe we could say but undetermined, but undetermined. 
Man. Uh, it's I can't I'm not I'm not going to try to write uh, in uh, iambic pentameter right now <laughs> in lifetime, but this rhythm of ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum is sort of standard English meter, and this poem Fire and Ice, even though we don't have true perfect rhymes like in the Shel Silverstein poem that I've looked at twice now, right? Shut it, cut it, live them, give them. We don't, we get a little bit of fire, desire, but then ice, fire, twice, hate, right? But we get some say the world will end. And then we get a three syllable and it sounds a little strange in fire. Some say in ice from what I've tasted of desire in fire, desire. <laughs> I hold with those who favor fire, right? So, um, Again, I don't want to say too much more about this because it's easy to get confused, but I think it's it's my job to at least show you what iambic pentameter is. It means a 10 syllable line of unstressed stress. Uh, 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 uh. And it's important to see this stress, unstressed rhythm in English because even if a poem is not in full true iambic pentameter, that means 10 syllables per line, this rhythm of unstressed stressed is everywhere, is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And we'll look at an example of this right now. But I want to make sure really quickly, does this idea of unstressed stressed make a little bit of sense uh, uh, enough so that we can start to look at it in another example poem. So do you at least know what I'm talking about when I say unstressed and stressed syllables? You with me? Yes. Stop me if you're not. Okay. Let's look at this poem. One of my favorite poems in English. This is what the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Now, this is not an iambic pentameter. I'll tell you that right now. We don't need to worry about that. But if you look at this first line, tell me not in mournful numbers. How many syllables do I have in this first line? Nine. Frank says nine. Do we agree? Tell me not in mournful numbers, eight. eight, this is eight syllables. And we'll only do this for the first stanza, you guys. How about the next line? Life is but an empty dream. Five. No. I heard, did you say seven, Frank? No. <laughs> uh, I think. Seven, I think. <laughs> and, and this is why, again, this is why I don't make you do this too much. Identifying syllables for non-native speakers is so hard. So don't get too scared or sad right now, okay? It's so hard. It's so hard. But I'll just count it off for you now, too. For the soul is dead that slumbers. How many there? Thank you. Oops. And things are not what they seem. Thank you. Now notice something right away. What do we notice? 8787, eight, right? So even if you just do a basic, if you just start to look at the number of syllables in a line, this is why it's good to at least look because again, a good poem and all the poems I'm showing you, this isn't an accident, right? The poet is trying to do this. The poet is trying to do this. Let's even look at the, at the next line and make sure, right? If we think, ooh, this looks like 8787. Eight, life is real, life is earnest. What do we got there? Life is real, life is earnest. Seven again. Yeah, how about here? And the grave is not its goal. Seven. You. Dust thou art to dust return next. Eight. Eight. Yep. Was not spoken of the soul. 
seven mm -hmm. again. Yep. Oh. But I know one thing. So we have so we have a, a line that looks like wait a minute, but this is only seven. But tell me, what is special about this line? If you look at it? what what is really obvious? What do we have going on? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with Cezira. Not an excellent excellent relation. Uh, good. So Linda's talking about just the words. We have a the word life is repeated. Absolutely it is. And actually life is, life is. There's a special word that I won't even scare you with, but when poets repeat the same word or phrase, absolutely, Linda. But remember, enjambment is about punctuation. What really stands out about this line? Punctuation wise? Uh, I'll ask a hopefully more easy question. What is the punctuation in this line, line five? The, the exclamation. Excellent. And is there only one or there are two? Two. Ooh, absolutely. And and we have one at the end of the line, but we also have one right there. In the middle. Right. Absolutely. So even though we only have eight syllables, the poet is really controlling the rhythm, the meter, with, with Cezura here. So I'll just read the first two stanzas and see if you can, now that we've looked at the number of syllables, see if you can hear the rhythm here, right? So this is what the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. So we've got syllables, cesura, and rhyme all coming together to give us this rhythm. Now, again, this is not iambic pentameter. This is a different part of rhythm in, in American uh, sort of English poetry here. But notice numbers, slumbers, right? Dream, seem, earnest, returnist, goal, soul. So even just these first two stanzas in this poem, if you sort of wanted to explain what was going on with the meter, with the rhythm in this poem, again, I'm not asking you to memorize the list and tell me there is a name for this, right? There is a name for this type of rhythm in English. Uh, and actually when it says the psalmist, uh, this structure, this type of poetry came from some of the first earliest English translations of the New Testament, of the Bible, and the Psalms in the New Testament are poems, and the people who were translating into English for some of the first times started to develop this poetic structure to talk about the Psalms in the Bible. Now, who cares? You don't need to worry about that, but if I ask you to say, tell me a little something about the meter or the rhythm in this poem. I hope that you could say, okay, well, there's rhyming, right? There's rhyming going on. There's also some interesting things going on with the cesura, right? Because look at comma, exclamation, comma, period, exclamation, semicolon, uh, a comma, uh, period. So do we have any enjambment in these first two stanzas? No. No, Frank, right? No. We, we've got punctuation at the end of every single line. We've got rhyme at the end of, you know, again, we could call this, this is called an A-B rhyme scheme. So line one rhymes with line three, line two rhymes with line four, line five lines with rhyme, rhymes with line seven and et cetera, et cetera. But the thing that I'm adding to show you today is this thing about syllables, the number of syllables is also important, is also a big reason to give you that good feeling. Hopefully, I, I think it sounds very nice and feels very nice. Um, it, it gives you that good feeling um, that'll help instruct the reader how to read the poem, right? What is the rhythm of the poem? Does this make sense when we talk about these first two stanzas and the combination of syllables, rhyme, and pausing? Yeah. 
Yes. Cool. So let's look at a different poem and then I'll ask you to do a basic sort of, uh, th let's look at my poem, why not? <laughs> let's do the same thing. Syllables. I'll read the poem. I'll just read the first two stanzas and then tell me, I tried, you know, that I'm not saying this is a perfect poem, but there's some structure here. You know, I was trying to do things on purpose. So let's see if we can count the syllables. Uh, so I've got the first stanza. Let's go stanza by stanza. Dear trailblazer, the trail is just your feet and nothing more. Your feet are just the trail you tread toward what God has in store. How many syllables in the first line? Eight. Ooh, Aki says eight. Does anyone agree or disagree? Eight. Andre says eight. He agrees. I agree. <laughs> How about the next one? Five. Andre says five. Does anyone agree or disagree? I think six. I think six. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, I agree with Rina. Okay, again, when we're not sure, let's say five or six, and then, excuse me, hopefully a good poet will, will show. Like, if there's a structure, you'll see it. You'll see it, so we can check. How about the next line? Your feet are just the trail you tread. Feet. Eight. Says eight. Frank says eight. We agree. Eight. Agree. Yes. Andre agrees. How about and number? How about the last line? Toward what God has in store. Six. Six. Absolutely. So let's go back up here. I've got eight. We were saying five or six, but I've got eight, five, six, eight, six. This is probably, hopefully, a big clue that this is six, right? Your feet and nothing more. Your feet and nothing more. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at this again. So we've got 868, eight. very interesting. Good, we've got some kind of meter here. Again, don't worry about what it is. If you start to practice just a little bit looking at the number of syllables, you're doing great. But again, we should think about stressed and unstressed syllables. So do we have any two syllable words in the first line? Uh, uh, trailblazer. Yes, trailblazer, Frank. And that's trailblazer. That's actually a three syllable three. line that I put at the beginning. Where's the stress? Laser. Yeah, trail. I'll give you trailblazer, trailblazer, trailblazer. Uh -huh. it, it's kind of, it might be the first one. It might be, excuse me, it might be the second one, but we know it's not, it's not trailblazer, right? It might be trailblazer or trailblazer, but it's not trailblazer. Okay. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> and then let's look at the rest. The trail is just, if we're thinking now, we've only got one syllable, um, excuse me, we've only got one syllable words. But remember my sort of very fast lesson today. In English, the argument is the only rhythm, the only real meter is da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun. So where's the stress? It, if I say the trail, am I going to stress the word the or trail? Trail. Linda says trail. Do we agree? Yes. Yes, I agree. yes. Exactly right. And how about is just? Am I going to stress is or just? Just. Exactly right. Exactly right. And how about here? Your feet. Two syllables. Unstressed. Stressed. What am I going to stress? Your or feet? Feet. feet. Your. Now, here's, now Linda said your. Now, this, yeah. is, this is why poems are hard. This is why rhythm is hard. The only reason that, your, that my native speaker brain knows to stress feet is because of this deep 
rhythm of iambic pentameter, right? Usually, if I've got two, two syllable, if I've got, excuse me, if I've got two one syllable words, the English brain, the English rhythm, like we were talking about Japanese, English, Russian, the English rhythm is gonna stress the second word almost always. So your okay. feet and nothing more. Your feet are just the trail you tread. This poem, when I wrote this poem, I was trying <laughs> to write in, in this iambic rhythm. Now again, not pentameter, right? That's Shakespeare, that's 10 syllable lines. An iambic pentameter poem means every single line is 10 syllables long, right? But even though I'm not writing 10 syllables for line, I'm trying to do this dun, 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 dun structure for the whole poem. And let's see if you can hear it as we continue, okay? So dear trailblazer, the trail is just your feet, nothing more. Your feet are just the trail you tread toward what God has in store. There was no trail before you moved, but now you've turned around to stare at what you've left behind instead of what's been found. The past is like the mountain mist where boats wake in the sea, returning to the unseen world, becoming memory. Instead, look straight ahead of you to plant your firm feet true with faith in you and earth and God enough to pull you through. But do not let this puzzle you about some perfect way to craft each precious mile of road you leave behind each day. For what's the purpose of this trail? It's just to try to see what sits beyond the boundary of each mountain peak, each sea. Now, easy for me to read it that way, right? I tried to read the poem. I mean, I wrote the poem. I tried to write it that way. But I promise to you, I'm not reading the poem with that rhythm just to, to try and make myself look good. I tried to choose the words to give you that unstressed, stressed feeling. And I hope that you can really see it in here when I have with faith in you and earth and God, right? We're not gonna stress in and and, we stress you, earth, God. And so this line, I hope, really shows you the dun, 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 dun. And, 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 and in English poetry, like I said, so many of our words in English come from German. We have so, and German and French, of course, but we have so many German words and there's so many one syllable words because of that German influence. So the way that an English language poet puts one syllable words next to each other is really important <laughs> because in a two syllable word, right? The two syllable word will tell you, hey, stress this syllable. But if you've got a line with a lot of one syllable words, the English brain is going to go bum, 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 bum. And a poet should be aware of this when they're choosing the word order for their poem. Does this make a little bit of sense? Or is it too much? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Let's start. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Say, Naki. Is it too much? Yeah, it's this uh, solving kind of reader. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, no sound, kind of no sound song. So we we okay. have to be kind of like composer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's difficult if I make. <laughs> and if you try, I'd say this, Aki, if you are thinking about writing your own poem, do not worry. Don't try, don't try to make, I'll say this. If you want to write a poem and try to write a poem in English, don't worry about the number of syllables. You know, I, that, oh, okay. sort of, what I'd say is write the poem and just write it in a way that you like. And then after, you know, and then the next day or whatever, take a break and then go back and look, okay, this is interesting, you know, for whatever reason, I have 10 syllables in this line. And then I have five syllables in this line. 
that is enough for me for the poetry project, Aki. If you write an English poem and then look at it later and, and start to do that analysis, that's beautiful. Don't worry about trying to write an iambic pentameter line. That's hard for me. That's hard for native speakers. You know what I mean? Don't, don't worry about trying to write a poem with this rhythm. I want you okay. to notice this rhythm in English poems. And then if you analyze your own example poems, just be aware of this, right? Okay, I use this word here, that's interesting. Or, oh, I have a three syllable word in line number four, you know, what's going on there? How does that affect the rhythm of the poem? Mm -hmm. That's what I really hope if you, if you choose to write your own poems. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about writing an iambic <laughs> poem, Aki. It's hard, it's hard. Yeah. Uh, anybody else questions? Other, uh, before we keep practicing a little bit. Yeah, I have a question. Let's go. I still uh, don't understand about the syllable. Can you are uh, underlined uh, like uh, you just read you uh, uh, the trail? Can you put the underline each syllable for the like a four one standard? So I understand more or less what the, I understand what the more syllable exactly how recognize. So in this second stanza, it's because I wrote the poem in, in I am's, in unstressed stressed. It's unstressed, the, the underline means stress. So if, and again, stress just means a vocal energy, how much time and length I give to the word, right? And you can really see in a word like around, like I said, you have to emphasize the second syllable. You can't say around, you have to say around. So I, I put this in a place in the poem where you get stress, unstressed. So again, unstressed, stress. So there was no trail before. Again, the word before has stress on the second syllable. So I put it here in, if um, there was no trail. Uh, I can't even, it's hard to break the rhythm. Uh, let me see, I'll just keep going. Uh, I'll just show you examples of where the stress is. There was no trail before you moved but now you've turned around, right? So it's un, unstressed stress, right? Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. To stare at what you've left behind instead of what's been found, right? And partly you get the rhythm from just sticking one syllable words next to each other, but here I've got two syllable word around, and the stress syllable in the word is in a stressed point in the line. Same thing, uh, the word behind, two syllables, stress on the second syllable, it's in a place where the second syllable is stressed in the line instead of what's been found, right? So it's, it's that rhythm of unstressed stressed that I'm trying to build into this type of poem because we see it in so many other English poems. And we'll look at another one together before we finish. I think um, this type of stuff is kind of a lot of detail, but um, that's all I mean by unstressed and stressed, Frank. Is that your question or are you asking? Oh, yes, yes, this is my question. Thank you. Okay, good. And again, in, an, in a poem that has this regular English structure, it should be, you know, knock on wood, you know, uh, that should be for every single uh, uh, um, stanza. The past is like, excuse me, the mound. So what are the three stressed syllables in this line, Frank? Uh, both. Good. Uh, wake, yeah. uh, uh, both, uh, in, yep, and see, boat yep. in sea. Good, exactly right. Or boats wake in the sea. Now, again, 
maybe someone would say, Jeff, you, you wrote a bad poem because you have a, you, you emphasized a preposition. That's fair. I mean, do, do you know what I mean? Like in a perfect poem that has a perfect sort of iambic, excuse me, hold on. In a perfect poem that has sort of perfect uh, iams, maybe you, maybe you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't have any stress on the in, but the way that I wrote the poem, that's exactly right. For boats wake in the sea. Great job, Frank. That what you just did, that's enough. That's plenty. That's plenty. That's plenty. Anybody else before I'll show you one more poem and then we'll finish up today. Anybody else? So okay. lucky you mean in the poem like a the first letter, it's not like a stress, right? Exactly. It's unstressed, the first letter of uh, any poetry. Uh, uh, it, not always. So I'll, I'll only say one quick thing about that, Linda, is there's one poem in here mm -hmm. and a very famous American poet called Walt Whitman. First of all, what do you notice about this poem? How many stanzas? One. Thank you. And how many lines? Four. Four. Yeah, do, and do we notice any, are the lines, do the lines look the same length or they look different? What do we notice just looking at it? Different length. It looks really kind of different and weird, right? Especially if uh -huh. you compare my poem where kind of all the syllables look kind of similar, even before we count the syllables, right? Or even uh -huh. our fire and ice poem, right? Even our fire and ice poem up here, you know, there's some that are longer and shorter than others, but but even, even these two short lines are kind of like, okay, this line kind of looks like this line. These lines look very similar in length. So this poem, and I have some more information about it in the PowerPoint, if you want more info, Linda, let me go back. Mm -hmm. It's in today's PowerPoint. This is called free verse. Free verse is the opposite of everything that I just said. Free verse is what I told Aki to do. Free verse is, don't even count your syllables. Don't worry about rhyming. Who cares? Just write whatever you want and, and put a line break wherever you want. And you don't need to worry about trying to create a specific uh, formal structure. It's totally free. So if I read this poem, hopefully you'll, you'll hear the difference between this poem and my poem, right? So this is Sometimes with the One I Love by Walt Whitman. Sometimes with the one I love, I fill myself with rage for fear I effuse unreturned love. But now I think there is no unreturned love. The pay is certain one way or another. I loved a certain person ardently and my love was not returned. Yet out of that, I have written these songs. Like I mean, a small paragraph. Perfect, Linda, exactly correct. Again, Walt Whitman was very famous. Some people love his poetry, very important American poet, but some people, hate his poetry because it looks like a paragraph. It doesn't have a lot of musical feel to it, right? Mm -hmm. no, rhyme, no real rhythm. Now, in a certain way, it's called free verse for a reason. The poet, like Aki was saying, you don't, when you're writing, you don't have to sit down and go, oh my God, how am I going to have a perfect 10 syllable line? You know, you just write whatever you want but it gives a totally different rhythm, a totally different meter, a totally different musical feeling to the poem. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I get it now. That's free verse. That's free verse. And like I said to Aki, I'll say to all of you, if you're going to write an English poem, you can write free verse. If you want to try to write like a, like a, a true rhyming poem, write a true rhyming poem. But I don't want you to feel like you have to have, you know, eight syllable, six syllable, eight syllable. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Um, and again, I'll put the PowerPoint, even though I probably won't get to talk about it today. If we have time, I can do it next week. Um, this is another a poem of Walt Whitman's, but there's some basic information about Walt Whitman. Um, and uh, like I say here, he's called the father of free verse because he was just like, no rules, no structure, no rhythm. I don't ever want to count syllables. You know, I just, I write whatever I want, you know. All right, I want to get you a little bit ready for that lesson uh, 10. I want to at least read the poem for you and then we'll finish up for today. So again, if we go to assignments, what I'm asking you to do is do a poetic analysis 
of this poem by Emily Dickinson. Now remember, when I say poetic analysis, I did say all the things, alliteration, consonants, assonance, line, stanza. So I'm not forcing you to talk about rhythm. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. So let's just look at this poem together. Tell me what you notice, and then um, we'll finish uh, probably a little early today. So here's the poem. It's called Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. So let's start with the symbol, like I said at the beginning here. There's a big metaphor, there's a big simile. What's going on with the feathers and the bird and the singing and the perch? What's going on? What do we notice? Well, let's start real simple. In the first line, hope is. I've got a metaphor or a simile. <sighs> Metaphor. Yes. Metaphor. Frank says metaphor and he is exactly correct. Ooh. Linda says metaphor and he is exactly correct. Hope is the thing with feathers. Now this is again where poetry is confusing, but in this case, excuse me, the thing with feathers is what? Don't think too hard. A thing with feathers is a, a thing with feathers that flies is called a bird. Thank you. <laughs> right. So if we're saying, if we said that in our in our poem last week, fire and ice, right? Fire is desire, ice is hatred. In this poem, hope is oh. thank you very much, Aki. Hope is a bird, right? So right away, if you want to start thinking about analyzing the poetic structure of this poem, thinking about symbols and metaphors, the whole metaphor for this poem really is hope is a bird. Hope is a bird, good. Now, if I read it again, we've got that in mind. So hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale, gale is an old English word for a very big storm, lots of rain, lots of lightning, scary gale, right, winds. So, and sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked the crumb of me. So we've got hope as a bird. What else, do, what else is, stands out from the poem? Do you hear a rhythm? Do you hear a meter? So I think there is a meta, yes. I think so too, Frank. And remember, if I go back to my document from today, remember the three main ways that we get rhythm in English are cesura and enjambment, rhyme, and then syllables. Do we notice it? Do we see rhyme in this poem? The question again, please. Do you see, remember, because we were saying, uh, I was saying, meter, right, rhythm is cesura and enchantment, rhyme, and then the syllables. So first, a, a good, easy question to ask when you're thinking about rhythm is, is there rhyme in this poem? Yes, it is. Yes, there is, Frank. Give me one example of rhyme in this poem. Rhyme is like uh, the, the each uh, the first first sound for all the odd number is wrong. The second uh, underneath all the 
the uh, even uh, line is all short. Ah, Frank, I love it. Frank's getting to be a poetry expert. Yeah, he was saying, Frank was saying the even lines, right? Line two. So we've got soul and all. And then actually, it's not even just the even numbers, Frank, because look, then we've got herd, bird right actually and and storm warm land and sea don't rhyme right land and extremity don't but we've got sea extremity of me so we don't have a sort of classic storybook rhyme again like in this first example where that we've read a couple times shut it cut it live them give them we don't have something that's that that sort of obvious but we've got soul all word heard storm warm bird heard land land doesn't rhyme excuse me then we've got these three lines at the end c extremity of me so we've got rhyme all over the place absolutely frank now again do we have a consistent uh, rhyme uh, no but remember part of the rhythm like we saw in the video from today is uh, when you have an expectation and then the rhyme changes when the rhythm goes dun 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 the time that it changes really stands out so we've got a lot of rhyme but it's not a sort of you know it's not like a mathematical equation where the rhyme is the same every single line good and i want to point your attention to something like this here Uh, and what I, I remember, all I'm going to uh, remember, the only thing you need to think about for rhythm in English poetry is uh, dun, 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 unstressed, stressed. If I, if I say just this line to you and sings the tune without the words, do we see some iambic, do we see unstressed, stressed in there, you guys? And sings the tune without the words. Eight this syllables. Yes, eight syllables, and exactly like we were saying, Linda, we, you know, um, you could say these are iambic rhythm. This is unstressed stress, right? Eight mm -hmm. syllables using unstressed stressed pattern, and sings unstressed and sings is stressed mm -hmm. the tune without the words. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this poem when you get ready to analyze it, you see lots of examples of unstressed stressed in this poem. And like I said, this is not a Shakespeare sonnet, but uh, this is the sort of beating heart of English poetry. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, what else do we notice about this poem before we finish up here? And it could be about any of these things. Alliteration, consonance, assonance, line, stanza. Let's go easy. How many stanzas in this poem? Um. Thank you. <laughs> Linda says one. How many lines in this poem? 14 or oh, 15. Oh, Twitter. Good. Twitter. Right? Thank you. I, I'm, I'll try not to confuse you. Yeah. yeah, this is the title and this is the author. So the, the whole poem is actually just these 12 lines. Thank you, Frank. I'm sorry if I was confusing. The, the link is if you wanted to see this poem, um, here on the Poetry Foundation website. This is just a great website with lots of free poems. Good, so again, our analysis could include, we've got a one stanza poem. We've got 12 lines in the one stanza. We've got rhyme. We've got a lot of unstressed, stressed rhythm going on throughout the poem. We've got a big central image, a big central metaphor about a hope and bird. And does anyone want to sort of, now we'll finish up here today, but. Do you want to sort of talk about what what meaning do we get from this poem? What what's up with the hope and the bird? What is she saying? I think she was like trying to say the hope is like a free bird, mm. like a, just like a flying in the sky and nobody can catch it or something like like a just in my imagination when it says like a hope is the thing with the feathers or yeah I was going to tell me no tell me again what what words or images give you that feeling of freedom i agree but can you tell me a specific line or image mm. he, try, he tried to experience his feeling as a bird to be free so he can get what he want to be he is asking me a cry of me 
means uh, uh, probably everything possible, extremity. But says, yes, never it extremity. What the extremity means? Extremity there is supposed to be like in the most extreme situation, like even when- Oh, okay. The oh, hard, okay. Specific, hard one. Yes. Tough uh, one. Exactly. I right. understand that. Uh, yeah, it's everything possible. Hope is possible, like okay. bad, like right. uh, freedom. I do think this is a there. I do think there's a positive feeling. I think there's a very strong sense of freedom in the poem. And I'll just suggest uh, for people who are watching the recording too, what's going on in line number three and four, you guys? What's going on in line number three and four? Oh. Like something about willing to get the freedom or to get where, like her goals or whatever she's thinking about or whatever she is hoping. Mm, I like it. And what's I, I agree, Linda. And whatever, you, like a, whatever she have obstacles or conflict stuff. I agree. I think there's some. And remember, all of my questions, Linda, are not because I disagree. It's just to help you practice this type of analysis. Remember. Yeah. Go back to the poem. Tell me a specific word or a specific line. I think there's three or four really important words in just these two lines, lines three and four. Like and it never stops. Good. I could, I totally agree. And again, if you think about that unstressed stress, right, it would be and never stops, right? It, it, the rhythm would be, you'd be emphasizing never, right? And never. Yeah stops at all right that's where the iambic rhythm is really helping you get a deeper meaning right and i think also if you look at line three it's and sings right there's this feeling of singing and for so many of us again this is why professor nor talks about a specific image singing is a freedom right singing is not like sadness failure fear we usually mm -hmm. sing when we're we feel good we feel free we feel like happy. a joyful mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So I think that's when, when you say, Linda, that feeling of freedom, I totally agree. I just want to make sure we can go back to say, ooh, in line three, when Emily Dixon, uh, Dickinson says it sings the tune, that feel of, that image of singing, that feeling of singing makes me feel free. And even more in line four, when she says, and never stops, like Frank was saying, there's that feeling of like, even when it's the most extreme, even when things are very difficult, even when things are painful, whatever, it never stops singing. Hope or never give up, right? right? Hope never stops singing. Hope is like a bird. Hope is a bird that never stops singing, right? And now this is, a, is an image, right? It really is an image. <laughs> Um, and it's a nice way of, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's why I love poetry, right? You could say, hey, never give up. Or I feel like, a, I, you know, I tell myself to never give up. Or my soul says never give up. That's beautiful. That's great, too. But for me, I think, and, and for people who love poetry, there's something very amazing to just say hope is like a bird that never stops singing. It's like, man. That's pretty beautiful. You know, it's uh, you give us that image and we get the feeling kind of, I always say like, like last week, right? It's like it bubbles up from under the water, right? Deep underneath us, we get something bubbling uh, when we see those images. Um, yes, 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 yes. Uh, anybody else just, so that was a really quick, so as you get ready to do this uh, activity, right? Rewatch this video. I've sort of given you a lot of, of hints of ways to start analyzing. And we didn't even talk about consonants, assonance, and alliteration. And there's definitely some really fun stuff that she's doing with, with those three things in this poem. Just for example, strangest C, right? Strangest C. Definitely got some alliteration there. Um, so hopefully some, some things that I, I've, I've given you some, a place to start when you do your analysis of, of this poem. Uh, but any other ideas or questions before we finish up for today? Do you guys feel ready to at least try to analyze this poem? Yeah, I can't. Yes, I can't. Uh, yeah. I can't understand the last, last line. The last line? Yeah, I asked the crown. So in this poem, what 
What means the crown? I love it. That's good. I'll leave that question for you. But if you think about birds, I'll say this. If we think about hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Okay, so hope is like a bird. Hope is the bird. So when I think about, if I have this image of birds and then I have an image of crumbs, that makes me think about birds eating the crumbs, right? So okay. if I imagine that hope is like a bird. Hope is a bird. Mm -hmm. If you go, you know, um, and sometimes if you go visit different cities or people where there's pigeons and the pigeons know that the humans have bread, right? They, they want food. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think at the end of this poem, she's saying, it never asked a crumb of me. Hope never asked anything of me. I got, I'm just, I get really emotional when you ask that question, Aki, because I think this poem is so beautiful because if we think about, she, she's definitely sort of um, thinking about or writing about what hope means for her. So I, I, I love that question, Aki. So at the end, right, she says, I've heard it in, I've heard it. And by the way, it is going all the way back up to hope, you guys. So when she says, I've heard it, she means hope. She means the bird, right? Mm -hmm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea yet never in extremity. So in these extreme places, even in the most extreme places, hope never asked a crumb of me. Yeah, I mean, you get to decide a little bit, Aki. What does that mean for you? I, I think this is where, um, like Linda's mm. question at the beginning, right? My response to the poem and my analysis do come together at some points. So I think you're right, Aki. Why does the poet end the poem this way? What is she trying to tell us? I think that's a good question. I think that's a good question. But I will say for me, I still think it's a, a positive thing, right? I think it's, I think she's sort of almost amazed that hope is such a powerful feeling that even when the things are the scariest, even when the things are most extreme, hope keeps singing and it never asks anything of me, right? It never, it never asks me to be sad or scared or angry. It just keeps singing in these most extreme places. Um, that's how I would say it, Aki. That's how I would say it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I will. I will try to. Yeah. Analyze. And, and you know, I, 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 you know how I feel about uh, this class, you guys. I don't want you to spend uh, five hours doing this assignment, but if you can spend a half hour or an hour reading a poem and thinking about the meaning. I think there's a lot of rich and interesting things for you to think about with this poem. Like Frank, I already, you know, I said in Frank's uh, response to Fire and Ice, Frank learned a little bit about the poet and, and Frank really thought about it. Now I'm not saying Frank has the perfect answer, but I think it was great to read Frank's post in the discussion. If you haven't already, you guys uh, go back and read his post because it's great. It's just clear that he thought about it, read it a few times, and 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 that's all I'm really asking you to do. I don't want you to give me the perfect answer, um, but I want you to think about it. Think about it, right? Because um, okay. that's the beautiful thing about poems. I think they can kind of open. They can kind of reveal themselves to us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome. Um, so I've got lots of info. Maybe we'll do this next week. We'll see. But if we think about what's coming up, remember, just please, if you haven't already, do lesson nine in the discussion. Lesson 10 is there for you. And like I said, if you do it before next Sunday, I will grade it and give you feedback. So sort of giving you some more help to get you ready for the poetry project that is due in two weeks. I know I said I'd end early and it's only three minutes early, but that's it. That's all I've got. I'm going to stop the recording. And if Anybody has specific questions, I am happy to help, but otherwise, I will see you all next week.